Hello and welcome back. Today I want to look at the class A operation of amplifiers. What makes them special, their linearity and how can the amplifier be built to be linear, but also its major downside, namely the poor efficiency. Today I will be looking at mostly theoretical aspects and some multi spice simulations. So if you're curious, then keep watching. So let's start off with what class A operation actually means. So if we want to amplify a sine wave in class A, we will be getting a conduction angle of 360 degrees. Or in other words, the input signal, the entire sine wave, will be amplified by a single amplifying element. In contrast, for class B or C, where the conduction angle is lower, the input signal is partitioned and amplified in chunks. With these, there isn't a single element that will amplify the complete waveform. Now we can look at the generic graph of collector current versus base emitter voltage for a bipolar transistor to see the various operating modes that the transistor can go through. So at very small base emitter voltages, there's not enough voltage to open the base emitter junction, so there is absolutely no collector current. In this region, we can say that the transistor is off or that it is in cutoff mode. So since there's no link between input signal and collector current, this is a highly nonlinear area. Now at the other extreme, if we have a very large base emitter voltage, at some point the collector current can no longer increase, it reaches a plateau, and this is the region that we call saturation, or when the transistor is completely on. Again, since there's no link between a change in input signal and the collector current, Again, we are in a highly nonlinear area. Finally, we have the middle bit in which there is a definite link between input signal and collector current, which is also called the linear area. So this is the region in which you actually get proportional signal amplification between input and output on the transistor. And even though this is not perfectly straight, it's not a perfectly linear mode of operation, it's far better than any of the two extremes. And this is the part that we use to amplify signals. So class A operation is designed in a way in which the transistor is always kept in this linear area. In contrast, class A, B or B operation also extends the transistor into the cutoff region. And while class C goes both ways, going through both cutoff and saturation. So since the transistor is always kept in the linear mode of operation for class A, this is the mode in which the amplifier presents the least distortion and the highest linearity. Now, even if the transistor is always kept in linear mode, the linear mode of operation isn't perfect. So to show that, I prepared a few data sheets and the data that I'm going to show you, even though might not be present in all data sheets, it still represents general behavior of transistors. So specifically, if we look at the gain information about this particular transistor, so this is a general NPN transistor, 2N3904. First of all, we'll see this table in which the DC current gain, at least the minimum value is shown based on collector current. So it goes from a very low value up to a peak and then it goes down again. So current gain is current dependent. At low current, you have a very small gain. It goes up to a value and then it goes back down and the variation can be quite substantial. But if we go through the data sheet, we'll find another interesting graph that shows normalized DC current gain. And this also shows the behavior that we've seen in the table. So gain goes from a low value to a peak and then down. But it also shows us that gain is temperature dependent. So for the same transistor operated under the same conditions, you will have much higher gain at high temperature than you will have at low temperatures. And other than this, there's also the topic of frequency behavior. So this is a different data sheet, so BC807, again, general purpose transistor. And one of the things found in the data sheet is the transition frequency or the current gain bandwidth product. Or in other words, at what frequency does the gain drop down to unity? So when input is equal to output. Now, the transistor has a maximum gain at DC, and this gain just drops off until this frequency, and well, then it continues dropping off. But this frequency is important because this is where input is equal to output. 
Now, for this particular transistor, a minimum of 100 MHz is specified under these conditions. But again, if we go through the datasheet a bit, we will find this nice graph. So this shows that our current gain bandwidth product or transition frequency is also current dependent. So it goes from a low value to a higher and then to a lower value again. So the transistor by itself, although has gain, it can amplify an input signal, the exact amount by which it will amplify can vary quite a lot based on the signal and operating conditions under which the transistor is being operated. So even if you keep the transistor in the linear area, this is not enough if you're using it in an open loop configuration. The way to actually get good performance at good linearity out of an amplifier requires that you also stabilize the gain to a fixed value. And the key to this is to provide negative feedback in one way or another. Now, the general structure of the negative feedback amplifier looks something like this. You've got an input signal passing through a summing circuit, then this passes through the amplifier that has a certain gain, so its amplification value, you get an output, but this output also passes through a feedback network, so something that is providing a certain amount of attenuation, and this gets subtracted from the initial input signal. So the value that the amplifier is actually amplifying is the input signal minus whatever comes through the feedback network. Now, the mathematics behind the circuit looks something like this. The output voltage is equal to the input voltage times the gain, everything divided by 1 plus the attenuation times the gain again. And this looks a bit complicated, you've got a bunch of terms in there. But what you may notice is that if the gain is large enough, then this beta times gain is a very large term, so this 1 plus we can ignore. So when the gain is large enough, we can rewrite the formula in this shape. So the output voltage is the input divided by the beta factor. Gain doesn't matter anymore. So if your amplifying element has enough gain, the amplification of the entire amplification circuit with negative feedback applied will be independent of the actual gain value of the amplifier, if that makes any sense. So whether the amplifier has a gain of 100 or 10,000, the output voltage will be in relation to the input voltage based on the attenuation of the feedback network. And we can implement this sort of feedback structure over different types of amplifiers. So you can have a global feedback network over a complicated amplifier, like an operational amplifier, so something like this, or you can have a more localized negative feedback in a single transistor amplifier. So for example, in the common emitter amplifier built with a single bipolar transistor. In both cases, the output to input ratio is not set by the gain of the amplifying element, so the op amp or the transistor, but rather it's set using a set of resistors. So either R1 and R2 in the non-inverting amplifier configuration, or the load resistor and the emitter resistor in the transistor amplifier. As long as the gain that the amplifying element provides is large enough, then the only thing influencing the total amplification of the circuit is the feedback network. Finally, we need to connect the load to the amplifier. And as always, there's multiple ways to do this. So to illustrate some of these, I prepared a spice simulation. So let's start with the simplest example. Common emitter amplifier with the load connected to the collector of the transistor. Now, in an ideal situation, the voltage drop that can occur on the load with this sort of configuration is the supply voltage. So the peak-to-peak -peak output voltage will be the supply voltage. And in that case, the peak efficiency is, in theory, 25%. Now, in practice, there are a few problems with this circuit. So first of all, because you want to keep the transistor in its linear mode of operation, you will never saturate it, so the voltage drop over the collector emitter will never drop to zero. At the same time, you don't want to drive the transistor into cutoff mode, so the voltage drop on the load will never get to zero either. And finally, because you want some negative feedback and you add an emitter resistor, then the minimum collector voltage will be even further from zero because of this. So you will never really get the 25% efficiency. So if we run it and try it out, so we can see that 
The output voltage is a sine wave, it's going between 9.6, so slightly lower than 10 volts, the supply voltage, down to about 1.8, so the transistor is not completely saturating. At the same time, there is a bit of voltage drop on the emitter voltage. And to measure the efficiency, I prepared a set of automated measurements. First of all, to measure the average output voltage and current, and we use this to calculate the AC voltage and current on the resistor load, so we're not really interested in the DC part. Knowing this and the average input power, we can work out the actual efficiency, so how much output AC power is being delivered based on the average input power. If we look at the calculations, we're getting about 17.5%, so it's lower than the maximum achievable 25%. Now, the big problem with this arrangement is that other than the AC content of the signal on the load resistor, you also have a DC content. So one way around this is to isolate the load from your amp fire output through a DC blocking capacitor. But if you do this, you still need something in the collector of the transistor, so you still need to somehow supply DC current to the amplifying element. So you can create a split load like this, and now our load resistor only receives an AC signal. So it's going between plus two volts and about minus two volts. Now, the big issue with this arrangement is that if you want to generate large voltage swings, the high side resistor in the amplifier will not be able to provide any sort of current value that you need. So as the voltage drop on this high side resistor gets smaller and smaller, the current that it can pull will also get smaller and smaller. So what we can see is that on our output load resistor, so RL3, the high side voltage is a bit more distorted than the low side voltage. So the exact same thing is visible on the transistor, even though the high side swing is only going to about 8 volts, we still see quite a bit of distortion here. So the way around this is to complicate the circuit a bit, and rather than having a high side resistor, having a high side current source. Now, for the sake of simplicity, I only added the current source component here, but this is usually built with one or more transistors. And what this arrangement achieves is a proper sine wave output this time. So the current source can generate any voltage you want, smaller than the supply voltage, of course, but the current will be properly regulated. And this, of course, gives a very nice sine wave on the output, so almost nice and symmetrical. Now, the only problem with this arrangement is the bandwidth limitation caused by the output DC blocking capacitor. So this capacitor together with the load resistor is forming a high pass filter, thus limiting low frequency response. So one way around this is to remove the capacitor and rather than using a single power supply, use a differential power supply. So a connection that looks something like this. Here, the static operating point of the amplifier, the DC operating point is set to the half voltage of the supplies so that when the load resistor is connected in between these, there is no DC current. Only an AC current will appear as the output of the amplifier varies around the static operating point. So if we look at the voltage drop on this load resistor, we again see it's nice and symmetrical, and the average voltage on the output is equal to the, roughly at least, to the middle supply voltage. So you will see this sort of technique applied in all sorts of amplifiers where you have differential supplies. And by doing this, we are no longer limiting the low side bandwidth from the output stage. Now, next, we can improve a bit on the circuit by replacing the constant current source circuitry with a component that opposes a change in the rate of flow of current, an inductor. So we can build something like this. Instead of having a resistor in the collector of the transistor, we can put a reactive element, an inductor. And the main benefit of this is that the current flowing through it will be roughly constant, so it's barely varying between 98 and 95 milliamps, so it does work like a constant current source. But the interesting thing about the inductor is that the voltage developed on it has a polarity change based on whether the current is increasing or decreasing. So when the inductor current is increasing, the inductor is working like a load, there's a positive voltage drop on it, so here in the middle we have zero, and above it we have positive voltages, but when the inductor is discharging, so this falling slope, the voltage on it becomes negative. So the inductor is working like a generator, generating some voltage into the circuit. And the importance of this is that this allows the output 
to swing not just between zero and the supply voltage, but rather between zero and two times the supply voltage. So we can see here in my circuit that the output is going between roughly one volt and 19 volts. So way more than the 10 volts that I'm using to supply the circuit. And other than supplying more than the supply voltage, the benefit of this is that the maximum theoretical efficiency that can be achieved with this sort of circuit is 50%. So it's double that of the previous arrangements. Now, just to verify that the efficiency actually increased, I prepared this set of measurement statements to first of all measure the power dissipated on the load and the power consumed from the power supply, and then divide the two to obtain the efficiency. This time, since there's only an AC component going through the load, there's no more need to remove any DC power that is dissipated on it. And now if we check the error log, so we have this second set of measurements, we can see that we're getting quite a good efficiency of 41%. So it's below 50, 50 is ideal, but it's still better than the 17.5 that we were getting previously with the load connected directly to the collector of the transistor. So this sort of circuitry is quite widespread with radio frequency circuits. Finally, we can replace the inductor with a transformer. So this will help us with removing the DC blocking capacitor, so we are achieving isolation using magnetic fields. And with this arrangement, we still get the same double output voltage. So we can see that the voltage drop on the load resistor is going between minus nine and plus nine. So roughly double the supply voltage. Now, having a transformer also brings the benefits of, well, having a transformer. Other than DC isolation, you have impedance matching, you can have any number of turns on the primary and secondary, and it's also a wideband circuit. You can also have impedance matching with some of the previous circuits, but usually it will be narrow band. Finally, the last thing to mention about class A operation and regarding its poor efficiency is the static operating point. And the fact that this needs to be in the middle of the currents or voltages that it can supply. So what I have here is the very first circuit that we looked at. This is outputting a sine wave between 1.8 and, well, almost 9.5 volts. But the exact same circuit without an input signal is outputting a voltage right in the middle of this sine wave. And, well, outputting a voltage isn't that big of a problem, but you also have a static current that is always going through the load. So even with or without a signal, you have this current running through the circuit. And one of the consequences of this is that both circuits, so the one with an input signal, the one without an input signal, if we check the power consumption, so the one with an input signal is 850 milliwatts, the one without signal is 845 milliwatts. So the class A amplifier has roughly the same power consumption, whether it's doing something or not. And the peak efficiencies that you can get out of them are only obtainable when you have a maximum amplitude signal going through them. Otherwise, efficiency will be even worse than that. In the end, the class A operating mode of amplifiers offers the benefit of high linearity and wide bandwidth, making it ideal not just for wideband high fidelity audio applications, but also radio frequency applications since it can support any modulation strategy. Since there are no resonant circuits involved, the amplifier output can closely follow whatever signal is on the input as long as a proper negative feedback loop is in place. The major downside though for this type of amplifier being of course its efficiency. And depending on how you connect the load to your amplifier, you can have better or worse levels of efficiency. Now, as always, theory is nice on paper, but you need to test it out to make sure. So next time I will be building such a circuit and testing it out. But until then, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.